the Lord, praise the Lord in all of his glory, hallelujah, my Lord, my Lord, thank all of those who are on YouTube and Facebook this morning, God bless you for tuning in, fasten down your spiritual seat belts, we got a lot to try to get through today, and uh, I'll show you my subject title, which hopefully will help a lot of you today, God is bigger in, in this ever-evolving, changing, crazy, chaotic, gone-out-of-control world we live in, the church has to stay focused on who we are serving and whose hand that we are under. And we're having a tendency now to look more at the problem and the situation than the answer to the dilemma of whatever it is. As you well see, Christians don't get a free ride because we're saved. We're paying just as much for a gallon of gas as anybody in the world. And we're uh, experiencing shortages as well as anybody else in the world. Although, we have to face it in a different perspective. Not as woe as me and hum and glum, but praise God you had $5 to get a gallon of gas to come to church today. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And so we have to praise him for not what we don't have, but we praise him for what we do have. And we can grumble all day long if you want to, and that's not going to change anything, church. In fact, the matter is, in the next election, we're not going to be able to vote our way out of this thing. Sin is sin, and it continues to escalate by the hour, not just by the day anymore. And any time a nation uh, blatantly just disregards God in general. Now, I believe that the church is a lot bigger and a lot stronger than what we can imagine. But there's still a vast majority overriding people who has completely denied God, don't want anything to do with God, uh, ripped him out of our schools, but uh, he's allowed in after a school shooting, by the way. Uh, a little late. I mean, it's like throwing the dog out after he does something he's not supposed to. It's a little late for that. And, uh, but that's what we do, knee-jerk reactions to something we don't know how to be fixed. And only God can fix any of these things. Now, let me say this and listen closely. If God is not bigger than your problem, then you're the problem, not God. Don't say, well, God doesn't, you know, he doesn't do what he does. He doesn't do for me what he does for somebody else. Whoa. Then you're saying God is a respecter of persons? You're saying that he's nullified in light of his own, own work? And if that's true, then we just might as well go home. Because if God is a liar, then the word is a lie, and we cannot accept it any longer. But God does not lie. Should he be a man that he should lie? No. And what he does for one, he'll do for another. But he does it on his time and on his terms orchestrated by your faith, your faith. Not your mumbling and grumbling is not going to move the hand of God. Why do you think that the Hebrew children wandered for 40 years on an 11-day trip? 11 days, that's all they had to have faith in. They couldn't hold out 11 hours or they were screaming and hollering. So God let them wander in the wilderness. They came to the edge of it. They came to the edge of the promised land. Moses sent in two spies, or actually he sent in a bunch of people, all but two of them came back and said, Oh, we can't do this. There's giants in the land. And, you know, oh, my gosh, you just brought us out here just so we could die. But the other two said, Oh, no. Shall we not do well because God is on our side? And so he let them sit there for 40 years till he would get a generation to believe him. I do not want Bethel Worship Center to sit and die out for 40 years to find a generation of people that will believe God. We need to start today. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We need to start today. God is going because, listen, when Paul said in the book of Philippians, 
my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. That's exactly what he meant. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. How is it that Christ strengthens us? Through his Holy Spirit to give us the audacity to look at $5 gallon gas and say, Praise God, I got $5. Hallelujah. I went to the store today. And there was one loaf of bread left, and God gave it to me. And I said, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> See, there's a, there's a different way we have to start looking at things. Do you understand that worrying about anything is only going to do one thing? It's going to hold the hand of God back, and it's going to have detrimental problems in your life from your health. This is why the old people, they had it going on, baby. Hard work will never kill you, and it won't. But worry and will, because it does something to the inside of the body, and it releases chemicals that is detrimental to your health. Now, I understand this, that it's, it's, it's easier said than done. And uh, even my wife scolded me this week. She said, you don't worry about nothing. I said, you're right. It's not my job to worry about it. It's God's job. He'll take care of it. He don't worry about anything. He'll take care of it. It'll work out. It will just play itself out. Why? But not because I'm special. Not because you're special. It's because we're special to God because we believe in His Son. Right. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And so, you know, if we're just going to do what the world does, then what's going to make us different than what the world is? If the world cannot see faith in us, where are they going to find faith? If the world cannot see hope in the church, where are they going to find hope? What are they going to look forward to? I mean, when you've got a president that has record low approval rates, what have they got looking forward to? He can't fix this thing. Poor man can't tie his shoes. I don't mean to be disrespectful whatsoever, but it is what it is. Help us, Lord. Father, save his soul. Send the Holy Spirit to save his soul. That's the only thing that's going to make a difference in anybody. And no matter how bad that we don't like something, or, and especially somebody, we have an obligation to Christians to pray for their soul. We don't have to pray for blessings on them. We have to pray for their souls. And uh, I, I pray for the souls of Washington, D.C., because Lord knows they've sold them out to the devil. They've sold their soul to the devil. That's what money will do. Money, nothing wrong with money. If you got an overabundance and you ain't got nothing to do with it, put it in the bag, throw it in my yard, I'll pick it up. You ain't got blood or knock on the door. I'll get it. It's the love, the lust, the desire to tear up people's lives and to ruin them just for the almighty dollar. To do what? To stand before God and give an account. Give an account of your life. And every one of us here today will do just that. I found out there's three lines in heaven when we get there to face God. There's the Christians who will go to the judgment seat of Christ. There is the line for the white throne judgment where all the unsaved will go. And then apparently there's the line where the Catholics are at. That's the only thing I can figure. Because every time they get cornered up, they go, well, you know we're Catholic. <laughs> like, okay. And that means what? I'm not picking on my Catholic brothers and sisters. But it's just the line in which they use. And that's a, another line in which we need to really begin to refrain from is identifying ourselves to a particular denomination. And I, I know it's habit forming, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll say in conversations when talking to other people, it's happened a million times to me, you know, they'll say, well, you know, I'm Methodist. And when you trap people in that, or I'm Baptist, and you trap them in it, you go, well, what's that mean? They don't know what it means. Well, we, we go to a, a Methodist church. And I'm not picking on my Methodist brothers and sisters. I'm just using this as an analogy. Well, uh, we go to a Methodist church. Why do you go to Methodist church? Well, well I, don't, I don't know. Because uh, my granddaddy went there? Well, okay. I, I guess that's a good reason for you. I said, but are you hearing the word? Because no matter what church you go to, no matter what tag's on the door, if the word's not being preached, you're in trouble. You're just plain in trouble. I mean, it's just simple as that. You're in trouble. And you get caught in those traditional realms of this is what I do because this is what I've done. Well, how's the results turned out on that? Has it turned out any better from the first day that you tried this?
Because if it ain't, then that's a type of insanity of trying to do something the same way and expect a different result. It's not going to happen. And the only results that you and I can ever achieve is our wholeheartedness thrown ourselves at the feet of Jesus and what he's done on Calvary's cross and having faith in the Holy Spirit to change the things that we're incapable of changing. Hallelujah. Give God some praise in the house. See, the sin nature in which we were all born with, every child outside of Jesus was born with a sin nature. Why wasn't Jesus born with a sin nature? Because he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. We are conceived of man. And because that seed that was tainted from Adam to the day we live in, every human being is born under sin. Sin is destructive. Sin will deteriorate a body faster than what anybody can imagine. Let me give you an example. As a general whole, not everybody, but as in general. You take somebody who smokes, drinks, cusses, and does all those things what are visible sins that we consider within the church, and that person's 60 years old, and you take another person who's 60 years old, and they got saved, who knows when, maybe younger in life. They don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't cuss, they don't crowd around. The looks of their age difference is astounding. Absolutely astounding. So what's the difference? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Oh, well, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And they have done scientific studies in the world's biggest national hospitals, nation hospitals, I might say, John Hopkins, University of Maryland, uh, 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 Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania, uh, they all did studies on those. And they found out that people who had faith in Jesus who proclaimed their salvation through the blood, that they healed exceptionally faster than those who did not have no faith. It's undisputable. And that's done by an independent study. So God is bigger than $5 gas. God is bigger than empty shells. God is bigger than the, the crime and the hate that, that we see going on in this nation. And disarming America is not going to stop what's going on out there in that world just not going to happen. I mean, that's just silliness uh, to, to, to think that at all. So that's not going to go away. But God is bigger than all of those problems. But the problem with the problem is they don't like the solution. Because when you come to God, you lose control. I lose control. We are no longer in power. God's in power through His Holy Spirit. And we are to be guided and directed by the Spirit. Oh, no, they don't want that. Why? Because that would give them a godly conscience. You know what a godly conscience is? It's called conviction. Never, never argue with conviction. Thank God for it. Because that means that you, God, and the Holy Spirit are in good together. Because that's His job, is to convict you and me of the things in which we are doing that is outside of the Word of God. And trust me, church, I, you, from the front row to the back row, we all have issues in our lives. And it seems that once we come to God, we call them just our problem. But really, in reality, they're sin. And it has to be dealt with by the Holy Spirit. Understand this. You are no match for it whatsoever. You have no willpower over it. And the Bible says once a person has become to be born again, that sin no longer has an authority over them. And you do not practice sin. We all, one time before Jesus, we practiced sin. We didn't realize we were practicing it because we had became good at it. We became masters at it. We didn't think about it because we cussed. We didn't think about it because we smoked, drank, or whatever the case may be, uh, and, 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 and acted in, in different ways. We didn't think about it. Why? Because we practice sin. But when we got saved, the Holy Spirit began to convict us of the things in which we were not supposed to do any longer. But we struggled, I struggled for years, not understanding that it was not my problem to fix me. It was God's. 
It's you. He needed to fix me. And you and I has, have gone through periods of time in our life of struggles and wondering, where is God at? Why can't I get over this? Why can't I get past this? It's because we're trying to do it on our own, and the Holy Spirit is patiently sitting there, and he goes, when you get done playing, let me know, and I'll take care of this. I'm not going to kick a door in. I'm not going to slap your hands like you're a two-year-old toddler touching something on a coffee table you're not supposed to. When you come to your senses and realize that you can't, but I will, then I will. And that's what God does. And all of our faith has to be exclusively in what the sacrifice brought and the benefits thereof. Hallelujah. Can you give God praise in his house? So I heard this psalm actually uh, being quoted in the series that me and my wife have been chose, uh, that, I've been, that we've been watching called The Chosen on Prime TV. I don't know where else you can get it. But anyway, there's two series on there, or two seasons. The third one's coming out uh, sometime in December. And I personally think it's a very, very good show. It stays very, very, very close to the Word of God. There's some theatrics in it. And, and as I said before, the one thing that it calls me to take a deeper look at is that we read the Word of God, and as is, this is the only thing that Jesus ever did or ever said or ever went through or whatever the case may be. No, that's not true. It did not record everyday life of Jesus. We have to understand that Jesus was all man as well as he was all God. And he interreacted with the people as a man, as a fleshly man who did not have a sin nature, but he did have a will. We know that by, by the fact of the matter is that he had to guard, go in the Garden of Gethsemane and pray till he could get his will, his human will, this human will lined up with God's spiritual will. So you have to understand something. Your flesh is not saved. Your spirit is. You didn't get born again in the flesh. Nicodemus said, do I climb in my mother's womb so I'll be born again? He said, Nicodemus, no. That is what's born of water is water, but that is what's born of the spirit is spirit. And we're born of the water. What happened, ladies, when you had birth? Water broke, right? That's what the Bible's talking about. Why didn't Jesus just come in the spirit? He needed authority. Jesus needed authority here on earth? Yeah. Because God's word said, let us make man in our image and give him dominion, authority. So he came as a person. But as well, he was God. And the miracles in which he performed could only be done by God. They had never seen anything like this before. Until now. God graciously sent his son to the cross to do not only to save the world. I made this statement Thursday night because the Spirit clicked it into my, in my heart. And I never made this Spirit before in my life, but it just, it, it is true. The whole world, the entirety of the world is saved. The problem is, the whole world doesn't accept it. That's where the problem lies. God said, I so love the world. He didn't say to Jews. He didn't say to Protestants. He didn't say white people, black people, orange people, Purple people, whatever people, people, people. He said, I so love the world that I gave my only begotten son. That who would what? Believe in him. Not in a denomination. Not in Bethel Worship Center. Certainly not in Pastor Joe. Don't go there. Oh, my land. You'll be in a bad place before you know it. Not in one another. But to believe in him. Him what? Him. Calvary. Complete, total victory in which he achieved on Calvary's cross. And then he said, I'll just use this for an example. That total victory package, here it is. Take it. All of you that can believe me, take this precious gift that I'm giving you. And the church walked away from it. Oh, no, no, we're going, we're going, to, we're going to take on uh, rules and regulations and denominational uh, characteristics and, and all of these things. And God's not in them. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but God is not in that. God solely works in His Son, Jesus Christ, the crucified, the sacrifice. That's where He works at. And the quicker the church learns that, the far better off individuals will be. Your victory does not lie within Bethel Worship Center. Your victory lies within your faith of what Jesus has completed for you. Hallelujah. Yes, indeed. I've got contractors here today. 
Brother Brian sat back there. He builds houses. Brother Byron's back there. He built houses. And several of you in here. How many times have you men ever built a house and handed the keys over to somebody and they decided to build one behind it? It's stupid, right? I'm, not, I'm talking about, oh, well, no, I don't want that one. I, you know, I'll, I'll, build, I'll build one behind it. We're trying to do something that don't need to be done. The house is already built. The sacrifice has already been done. The victories that belong to us belong to us because of what Jesus be, uh, had victory over. He had victory over sin, hell, death, and, and, and the grave. He had all over. And then he said, you take it. So listen to this. Now, 14 verses I want to do in Psalms 139. It's a two-edged sword because it actually deals with Jesus being here on this earth. But as Jesus as our substitute, this psalm became a part of me and you. And how and what God does in your life will depend on how big you can believe your God is. Not in height, not in weight or stature, but in power. Now think about something. That what in lives by faith in you, the Holy Spirit, is the same identical spirit Jesus had. The same identical Holy Spirit that Jesus had in his mortal body is the same spirit that's in you. So why are we not doing the things that Jesus did? Because we won't believe them. I believe opening blind eyes. I believe in healing lame legs. I believe in the healing of the sin of leprosy. I believe in raising the dead. And any time God wants to use me to do it, then so be it. God will get the glory. Hallelujah. But I'm going to believe it anyway. I'm going to believe it anyway. So Psalms, if you will, 139. <coughs> Excuse me. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and know me. God knows you better than you know yourself. So quit acting like you know what to do with you. Because you don't. But God does. And if you will begin to say, search me, God, and fix me. Sometimes the greatest prayers are the simplest. Not long, drawn out, trying to speak in King James language to God because you think he hears you better. No, as I've told you many times, he's on the same language as ain't, nor, not, and have you et yet. He understands it. He understands every language in the world. And he, he, he speaks all of them fluently. Why? Because he gave them. So obviously he does know them. And so there's no big words that's going to move the hand of God. So what moves the hand of God in our prayer? Our hearts, our motivation, our whys. What are we looking to get out of God? I have to be honest with you. I don't want to be greedy here, but I'm looking to get all I can get. Because my God's a big God. Oh, hallelujah. My God's a big God. I'm looking to get all I can get. I'm not talking about financially or, you know, homes or cars or anything like that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really not in, into any of that whatsoever. Uh, I, I just thank God for what I do have. Drive down the road and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, watch the miles tick by and gas gauge going down. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, I just praise the Lord. I thank him every day for the little things in which I have. Just a time to sit out on the porch and watch the corn grow in front of my house. So I can't see nothing but corn. And it's coming quick. <laughs> but I thank the Lord for it. You know, and I, and I, I think a lot of times as I, as I watch the farmers who go out and uh, work feverishly to get things planted at a certain time, because certain crops have to be planted at a certain time, to get the maximum value out of the seeds. And, and I, I think about how they probably don't pay attention to how much faith that they have. Now, of course, years ago, it took a little more faith than that because there wasn't no irrigation systems. Now with irrigation, that's made a big difference. But still, that farmer goes out and he spends thousands and thousands of dollars to place this little TD seed in the ground at a certain distance apart, whatever seed is, and he cultivates it, and he fertilizes it, and he waters it. And by faith, he knows that that corn is going to grow, and that one little seed is going to produce many seeds and ears on that one stalk. That's a lot of faith. Even, even Jesus used that as an analogy. 
Unless a kernel of corn goes into the ground, it cannot produce fruit. Now, you and I, whether you realize it or not, we have an obligation to God to plant seeds. Not necessarily save people. You know, don't, don't ever do this because it, it drives me crazy. Don't do it to me anyway. People come to me, well, pastor, I want to tell you something. I saved 12 souls this week. You ain't saved nobody. You may have introduced them to Jesus, but you ain't saved nobody. You don't have the power to save nobody. But I thank you for your efforts. You just need to change your terminology about who saved who. Jesus saved them. Amen. And thank God for your anointing that you went and spoke the word and it touched people's hearts. That's what we're supposed to do. And a lot of seed planting is not so much of what you say, but how you live. People see that. And you won't believe sometimes, and you may not realize until you get to the other side, what seeds you have planted over the years. And I, I've used this many times for my own benefit. When Jesus talked about that there, when we get before him, the judgment seat of Christ, that we'll be judged actually on our motives of what we did, why we did it, and who we did it with or to or whatever the case may be. And I think all preachers will be judged on a different level based on not only what they said, but what they should have said and didn't. Oh, hallelujah. I don't leave much for the imagination. I will tell you that. I'm not going to. But he said that we are the seed planters and that when I get to the other side, and he talked about a reward, that which motivation was wrong will be burned up as hay as stubble. That which was good, there will be a reward. Now, we're not going to need money. There's going to be nothing in heaven to buy. There's no Royal Farms or 7-Elevens or Wawa's. So if that's your favorite coffee, go ahead and drink all you want now because you ain't getting it on the other side. Not going to be there. I don't know what the reward will be. But if I had my opportunity to tell God what I'd like to have as a reward, that when I get to the other side and my ministry is over with, according to the time of God, that the people that I didn't even know or never saw that somewhere heard a message in which I preached, heard a funeral that I was at, or a concert that we were singing. Something touched their hearts and they got saved. And they're lined up on both sides of that golden street. Not applauding me, but applauding the God I serve. And saying, thank you, preacher. Thank you. You didn't see me, but I was standing in the back. I was hiding in the corner, but I heard your words. And I knew they were right. And I was laying on a bit of affliction. I didn't call you, but I called on God. And I said, God, if you're that God that Pastor Joe preaches about, then save my soul. And they were saved. Hallelujah. That's the kind of reward that I'm looking for. Streets of gold, pure as gold, emeralds, diamonds, colors and precious jewels of beyond our mind's comprehension. And it's beautiful that they will be in heaven because of the glory of God will be shining radiant off in all of those things. They'll never be compared. Jesus standing out on the other side of that gate to every soul comes through there and says, Welcome in, my good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. You say, Well, preacher, I don't feel very faithful. Yes, you are, more than what you think you are. Because if you believe in Jesus Christ and Him crucified, you are faithful. Stay the course. Stay the course. Stay the course. Don't get off on these tangents that's going around, uh, the, this silly stuff that goes around, like the Hebraic movement where they've gone back to resorting to uh, doing, doing the, the feast and, and, and all these other legalistic things in which God required as faith, didn't require them as salvation, but required them as faith. I've only got one verse so far. Give me uh, the next one, if you will, please. Verse 2. You know my downsetting, my uprising. You understand my thoughts far off. 
Boy, there's a scary one. <laughs> God knows what's on your mind. He knows why it's on your mind. And the problem with the mind is it's an enemy against God. And that's what often gets the average Christian in trouble. It's not the devil. It's the sin-natured mind. Because it wants to get off on tangents. Well, I'll tell you what. If I can just do it like this, God's going to be pleased. No, he's not. Because now you injected yourself into it. I'll give you a case in point. I don't want to pick on, on, on nobody, but while I'm already doing it this morning, ain't no need to stop now. It is when you're talking about the church of God in Christ. You must be water baptized to be saved. What? The blood of Jesus didn't save me? Then now I got to do a mortal work of being dunked in water to be saved? Do you know how offensive that is to God? But a punishment that his son took for you and I, the whole world? I mean, a beating that, that no human being could ever withstand to the time and to where the Holy Spirit said, tell him it's finished, it's over with, let it go. Lord, under your hands do I command my spirit. It is finished. So now, if it wasn't finished, and I have to do something else to be saved here on earth, then did Jesus lie? No, man lied to himself. That's what happened. Water baptism was going to help you spiritually because it identifies with what? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You're making a public display in front of whoever people that are there. I, I don't like to do private baptisms because I, I think the pe people come away with the wrong idea. I mean, I will if it's, you know, Pastor, I just, I, you know, I, I just need to get it done. And, and, and we do them about once a year. Uh, I'll do them any time of year as long as it's warm. I'm not going down to the Nanticoke in 30-degree weather. I'll stand on the bank, and I'll say the words, and you can dunk yourself. I don't need to be involved in that one. Hallelujah. I remember down to CEC, when I got water baptized, the heater didn't work. And that water was, I don't know, i tell you one thing. They dumped me down in that water. I got saved three times, and they caught me at Reese Carey's when they finally got a hold of me. <laughs> it was cold. <laughs> uh, needless to say... Uh, I, I felt the need then to add a, a, a get a campaign together. Let's fix the water heater on this thing. Let's not do this no more. Listen to this. Verse 3. You can pass my path with my laying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Now, you have to understand something about people. And we use this cliche, people are people, and we are. We, we all have different personalities. We have different likes and dislikes, and we have different political affiliations, you know, whatever the case may be. Welcome to America. That's what we're supposed to be. But what God is saying here, and I'll read it to you again, you're acquainted with my ways. Well, not all of our ways are God's ways, but he knows about them, and he can change them. Now, let me read something to you here so you better understand. You can pass my path when I'm laying down, and you're acquainted with my ways. Commentary says the word compass means to scrutinize. Therefore, God scrutinizes the path of the Messiah and inspected all of his ways and found nothing but perfection. Now, how does that pertain to me, Pastor? Oh, because of the blood of Jesus? You're just as perfect as Jesus was. Oh, man, I didn't get an amen out of that. Listen, listen, some of you husbands should have elbowed your wife and said, I told you I was. <laughs> there the mind kicks into gear the wrong mind because in our natural mind you go how in the world could God ever see me as the perfection of Jesus because of your faith of your acceptance of Jesus if he doesn't view you as perfect then he can't have relationship with you and it's on Jesus perfection in which he has relationship with you not on yours. Not on yours. <laughs> because you think that you're flame blue and, and charismatic. God just likes you. No, he loves you because of his son. That's why he loves you. Stay with me. Number four. 
For there is not a word in my tongue, but, O oh Lord, that you know it altogether. Boy, that could get us in trouble, couldn't it? Let me read it again for you. There is not a word in my tongue, but, lo, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. Listen to commentary. God knew all about the words of the Messiah and his ways, even his thoughts. While they were being formed, he found all to be perfect. Again, we go back to what happened. Jesus' perfection became my perfection. God, per God sees me not as his son, but as his child. I am a son of God. You're a daughter of God. We are people of God. And that all became because of the perfection of what Jesus gave us. It's not about how good you are. It's about how great the sacrifice was. That it was powerful enough to take care of the whole world for the last 2,000 years, then, now, and beyond. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Give God praise in his house. You have beset me, verse 5, behind and before, and laid your hand upon me, verse 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, and I cannot attain it. We struggle sometimes in the Word of God to just take God's Word for face value. But now... In saying that, the value of God's Word from Genesis to the 22nd chapter of Revelation is all one love story about a man who gave his life for you and I. It is a story about the redemption of humanity. And this is why psychiatrists can't fix us, psychologists can't fix us, because it deals with the natural mind. And this... Change has to come spiritually. Child of God, before I came to Jesus that faithful Sunday morning, the night before, I had no need of change. I had no desire of change. My life was fine. So I thought. I was living the life that I wanted to live. One of sin. Going to hell as fast as you unlock wheels of time and turn on a skateboard hollering, yee -haw. And didn't care. Why didn't I care? Because I had nothing to care with. But through the faithfulness of my wife and other people of the church praying for my soul, God decided, this is the day of salvation. And he grabbed my heart and saved my soul. And I walked out of there, as I have for the last over 30 years now, not only saved, but a new creation in Christ. A new creation in Christ. And I say that to encourage you because you are the same new creation in Christ as I am. You have testimonies. God has brought you a long ways. But don't think for one minute you've arrived yet. You're not there. I'm not there. But I'm on this journey. And this journey is a faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done, not what I can do. And that's what changes me. Why did he say in Isaiah, I am new every morning? Because he is. Behold, don't you see I do a new thing? New to who? New to you. There's nothing new in the Word of God. You know, people come and say, man, I got a revelation in the Word of God. I said, no, you just found out something you didn't know. It was always there. <laughs> now, I think the Holy Ghost does give us revelation and understanding of his Word. But it's not nothing new. It always has been there. We just never found it before. Let me go uh, verse 7, if you will. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? Footnote says, The Messiah exalted in knowledge the, greatness, uh, the greatest distance could not separate him from God. Nor the darkness of night Hide him from the Father's loving eyes. Can I do that again? The Messiah exalted in knowledge that the greatest distance could not separate him from God. And again, this does not just deal with Jesus. Do you know the greatest distance between you and God is inside of you? Did you hear me? That which is inside of you is God. Amen. It is the spirit of the almighty God that he imparted into you 
When Jesus said, it is finished, and the temple veil was rent, and, and, and the Holy Spirit came out and departed into every individual that believed in that salvation day. Hallelujah. That's how close God is to you. This is why that you cannot go anywhere that God is not with you. Don't think for one minute that you're in some darkened bar room somewhere that God's not there. Because he is. We sing this song during concert time, and it was on our, our last CD. I met Jesus in a bar. I know it's a strange title to some of you that maybe are here new. But it's actually the man who wrote that song wrote my testimony. He literally wrote my testimony. Because my wife had been saved some two years prior to me being saved, and I was still living the, 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 the life of a sinner uh, out in the world. Uh, I, I was still playing music in every honky-tonk that would let me in to play a guitar. And, uh, and, and as she was praying for me, I just got miserable. I mean, miserable. What was making me miserable? Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Oh, he wasn't in me, but he was there. That's why I was miserable. Because without the convicting power of God, how is somebody going to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus? Now I'm playing the drunks. And I'm as drunk as drunk as they are. And I hated the drunks. <laughs> the very people that's paying me. <laughs> why? Because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit that is there. I literally met Jesus in a bar. And he saved me out of the darkness into his marvelous light. And he does it for any and everybody. You may meet him on the back row of a church. Fine. You may meet him in a cornfield somewhere. Fine. You may meet him in your car going down the road in heavy traffic. Fine. But just make sure you get to a place where you meet him. Because he wants to meet you. Hallelujah. Give God praise in his house. <laughs> So verse 8 says that if I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. Now you have to understand that verse, and I'll read the footnote to you so you better understand. Because there was a time where the heaven that you and I are going to, wasn't, it, not that it wasn't there, man didn't have access to it because Jesus hadn't died yet. So God provided this place called hell and paradise. It was in close proximity. There was a great gulf in between it. We know that from Luke chapter 16 where the beggar died and he was uh, he woke up in hell. The beggar died. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The rich man died and he opened up his eyes in hell. There was nothing there to escort him. When the beggar died he opened, it, uh, an angel of the Lord was there to usher him in to the bosom of Abraham. So Abraham, David, Moses, Ezekiel, name them all, Deborah, whoever uh, died by faith in the Old Testament by the ways in which God gave them means to have that faith in of what was coming instead of what has already happened. He gave them that opportunity to be on and in the paradise side, not the burning hell side. Amen. Okay. So, all right. So you understand where I'm coming. Paradise and the cavern thereof, somewhere in this earth. Now listen to me. We know that the liquid center of this earth is a molten blaze of fire that is thousands of thousands and thousands of degrees. Welcome to hell. An unquenching, dying torment that the souls of people, no matter good, bad, or indifferent, bad people just don't go to hell. No. Good people don't go to heaven. Saved people go to heaven. Amen? Not my plan. Don't be mad at the preacher. I don't like what the preacher said. I didn't say it. The Word of God said it. You be mad at God. Don't be mad at me. Don't waste your time being mad at me. I'm not going to spend much time worried about it anyway. I don't mean to be mean. I, I, I've got bigger fish to fry. There's lost souls out here that need Jesus. Instead of our little petty quarrels. I don't believe this and I don't believe that. Well, if I give you anything that's not in the Word of God, if I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. So what did Jesus do when he died on the cross? In the book of Ephesians, it said that he descended before he ascended. What do you think? He was asleep three days in a cave. He wasn't in there. 
He'd already descended down into paradise. He preached to the fallen angels to remind them what they had done and the price in which they were now paying, what they had got themselves involved with. And then it said he led captivity captive. Those that were captive because of the lease in which had now been paid by Jesus and taken away from the devil, those people were now free to follow him out of that tomb. And they did. And Matthew has said that those saints were seen walking the streets of Jerusalem they hadn't seen in hundreds or maybe a thousand years. But they were recognizable. And he marched them right on into heaven. Hallelujah. So how big is your God? <laughs> My God is bigger than what's going on in this United States church. And let me, let me say this about the United States. It's like Noah's Ark. It may stink, but it's still the best ship on the ocean. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I ain't seen nowhere I'd rather be than here. Not, not, not in the least. And I love America. We put that flag up behind me for a concert. I don't know how many years it's been, but it's been several years. And I put it up there for a backdrop just for the concert. I had every thinking that after that following Sunday morning we did service to taking that flag down. They said, oh no, preacher, don't take that flag down. People have watched us on YouTube and Facebook and are here today in this church, not just because of the words and what God has given me, because they see that flag that God has blessed America. It means a lot to me. Because it reminds me of every man and woman who has served and laid down their life, sacrificed for me to be able to have the freedom to come preach the Word of God without having fear that somebody's going to bust through those doors and arrest me. Trust me, if our government could do that, they would. Nancy Pelosi, go look it up. It's on YouTube. It's on there just as big as life. The greatest threat to America is not Islamic terrorists. It's the Christians. Oh, she's Catholic. She, she's in that third line. I'm sorry. She's in that third line. Lord, save her soul. As much as I dislike what she does and who she is, God, save Nancy Pelosi's soul. Hallelujah. Let her have a great awakening. Listen to this. Verse 9. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, Verse 10, even there shall your hand lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. No matter where I go, God is with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they protect me. They prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies. God anointeth my head with oil. And everything I got, my cup runneth over. Runneth over with what? Money? No. With the blessings of God. Just the opportunity to serve Him another day. And whatever that day brings, my cup runneth over. David says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. They're talking about leaving a carbon footprint. I'm leaving blessings and glory shall follow me all the days of my life. Hallelujah. I'm leaving a blessing footprint everywhere I go. Because you and I are blessed of the almighty God. Almighty God. I heard Brother Jimmy Swagger give this analogy about his own life, and it was so true. So true. He was very young. His grandmama was a praying woman. Praying woman, as fall accounts. And she taught him how to pray. And one of the things that he was doing one day as he was praying struck her wrong. And she said, Jimmy, stop. Stop praying like that. He said, what, Grandma? He said, quit praying those little teeny prayers. Pray big, Jimmy. God's a big God. God's a big God. God's a big God. Pray big, church. Pray big. Pray for a move of God like this world has never seen before. And it can start right here at Bethel Worship Center. Don't tell me it can't. Had to start somewhere. 
Man, I want an Azusa Street movement again. <laughs> I think I said this last week, but I'm going to remind you again. Stupidest thing I ever saw, one of. If I looked at the news now, it'd be something else stupid. That an African American, I don't know if it's Congress or Senate, said the gospel is just a white man's gospel. And I went, what? Did he miss William Seymour, who in 1906, an African American, was the one that ushered in the Azusa Street Holy Ghost revival like the world has never seen? And you have the audacity to tell somebody that lie? I still think that God said, I so love the world, Amen. not just the white man. Can somebody help me preach up in this house? I'm so sick of identity politics. I mean, I am sick of it. God don't care what color we are. He cares whether we accepted their color, red, called the blood. That's what he cares about. Man. That's what destroyed America. Why? Because it's orchestrated by the devil. Divide and conquer. We're supposed to be a United States. We're anything but that now, church. Because this one wants special rights and that one wants special rights. And I'm going to tell you something. You might be mad at me if you want to, but I'm going to speak the words of truth. Any time that you will designate an entire month to nothing more than sexual and malady sin, you think God's going to bless that? You are wrong, church. You are wrong. That's the same thing that destroyed Rome. They got too big for their own good. And they shook their face in God's face. Shook their fish, should I say. We don't need him. We're Rome. We conquered the world. Excuse me. Newsflash. You don't own it. God does. Amen. God owns the world. He's a big God. Amen. Big God. Hallelujah. He's a big God. You cannot promote sin. You cannot promote the killing of innocent lives and think God's just going to say, oh, that's okay because I know that you know you're all Catholic or you're all not saved. I, I, just, I just overlooked that. God doesn't overlook anything, even with you and I. That's why the Holy Spirit convicts us where we're at, and rightly so. Convict me, Lord. Search my heart. Create a clean heart in me, David said. Create David, David, the king of Israel. The man who murdered. The man who committed adultery. The man who fumbled and bumbled. It seemed like every time he turned around. But God said, this is a man after my own heart. Because when you read the book of Psalms, David knowed how to repent. Amen. He knowed how to recognize who he was and who God is. And how bad he needed God. See, those people back then didn't have what we have. They didn't have the Holy Spirit that lived in us. They had to go through the Levitical system of rituals and rules and to, 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 to display the faith to God that I believe, Lord. And, but the things in which they did wasn't for their salvation. It was for the belief of the salvation that was coming. And therefore, God and, and, and gave them uh, uh, righteousness because of their faith. Abraham was what? Saved by his faith in the righteousness of, of, a, of a God coming uh, in Jesus and dying on the cross for him. He said he saw the promise afar off. Look at it in, 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 in book of Hebrews, chapter 4 or 5, somewhere in there. Anyway, he saw the promise afar off and believed it. I believe that the sacrifice is coming. I don't know when it's coming, but when it does, I'm going to be okay. God counted it as righteousness. What makes us right? The blood of Jesus. You, child of God, are the righteousness of God. You, child of God, or the holy temple of the Spirit. That's a lot to live up to, isn't it? You think about that the next time that somebody steals that last parking space at Christmas time and you're in a hurry. You are the temple of God. You think about that when that old woman is pulled up to the McDonald's window and you're already late for work getting coffee and she's counting pennies out of that little squeeze purse that they got. True story. So I read. A little old woman was up to one of those driving windows. And she sat and she sat and she sat and she sat. 
Finally, the guy behind her honks the horn. Burr. Didn't phase her a bit. She sat, she sat, she sat. Burr. She didn't move. About the third time, she opened up her door and squeezed out the door, walked down to the side of the man's car, and he said, young man, my car has quit and won't start. And if you will push it off to the side, I'll stay here and honk your horn. <laughs> I said, hallelujah. <laughs> Give me verse 11, if you will, please. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> so be, be patient. I, I, listen, I don't like to do drive-ins. I'm just too impatient for them. I'm just too impatient. Don't put me in a drive-in line unless I'm the only one there. And then I want them to hurry up so I don't use them. I'll just go inside and do whatever. I like online ordering. Y'all ever order online? Man, you pick up your phone. You, you, you Google your favorite restaurant, and they'll have it ready for you when you get there. They ain't bring it to your house. You ain't got to go nowhere. Let them burn $5 over for a guest. Praise the Lord. I don't know how to use technology. Grow up! It ain't going nowhere. You just probably learn how to use it. No, I agree. All technology is not good. But boy, it is when you go order hamburgers. I order my lunch from Smash and Dash. Give whatever I want to do. Man, go down there and pick it up. I'm standing in line. Hallelujah. Thank God for technology. Listen to this. Where am I at? Verse 11. 11 and 12 are going to run together, so I'll just give you a warning back there. If I say, surely darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Meaning there's nowhere you can go as a child of God and be in darkness. Why? Because you're a child of the light. Now I'm going to get myself in trouble again with some of my pastor buddies, and I love them. But church, I just cannot see the value in painting the walls of a church black and putting in black carpet and black seats and colored lights and strobe lights and smoke. I did all that 35 years ago in the bar. Why would I want to do that in the house of God? And plus, I'd be up here with smoke going, <coughs> eyes water. I'm just saying. To me, I guess I'm just a traditionalist. I just don't see that benefiting the house of God. And they say, well, you know, people are a little reluctant to worship in the light. Not if they're of the light. <laughs> people didn't worship where I used to play. Oh, they did. They worship the devil. They worship Jack Daniels and Jim Beam and Budweiser that didn't make you a bit wiser, made you stupid. And his cousin Johnny Walker, wild turkey. You want to get some foreign names where to do Smirnoff? Yep. Yep. Oh, gee, there you go. You're going to tell on yourself. <laughs> Jose Cuervo was a friend of mine. <laughs> I used to drink it with a little salt and lime. <laughs> Boy, how crazy were we? Aren't you glad that God let you live through that? Huh? <laughs> Aren't you glad that God let you live through that? To see the difference between that? This is why church has to be different. It can't do what the world does. This mess of trying to bring the world into the church is ridiculous. The world needs to be changed by the church. Not pacified. I didn't come to pacify you. I come to give you the truth. And, and, and listen, there is no doubt in my mind I could change my form of message. I could go preaching a social gospel with little to no conviction at all. I could go preaching prosperity about how rich you're going to be because you came to God, whatever the case may be, and probably have 12 or, or, or twice or three times as many people. But let me tell you something. Give me a 12 by 12 room with a 60 watt light bulb hanging by a cord in the middle of the ceiling. And I ain't got to have a guitar. I can praise him without it. And give me five spirit filled people that believe in a move of the hand of God. And I'll show you a world changer. I'll show you what can change the world. It ain't about numbers. It's about the word. 
Yes, verse 12. The darkness hides not from you, but the night shines as day. The darkness and the light are both alike you. Meaning that these two verses, that God, that it is all open before God. You cannot get into the darkness deep enough that God does not see our sins. You cannot close the blinds, hide in your bedroom, or anybody else's room for that goes, and God not know your sins. It is there. This is why we have to be honest with God. Now, the last verse I want to use here, if you will, please, verse 14. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 13. Verse 13. For you have possessed my reins. You have covered me in my mother's womb. Footnote, this passage pertains to the incarnation of Christ. These words, possess and cover, mean here to collect and to knit together the reins and the comprehensive term embracing the human body, both physically and emotionally, meaning this. Let me read it again, and I'll make my comment. For you have possessed my reins, and you have covered me, you have covered me, have covered me, in my mother's womb. Life begins at conception. It's not a tadpole. If life can be detected, it's a life. And now we got Supreme Court justice trying to be assassinated in fear that he might be a part of taking away killing babies. Here's a, here's a wild idea. Here, just let me throw this at you. Did you ever think individuals could be responsible whether they got pregnant or not? Would that be too much to ask? For you to be responsible of your own actions before you have to kill an innocent child? Ah! Don't ask me to be responsible. I ain't been responsible since kindergarten. I didn't listen to her, and I ain't going to listen to a cop. And I ain't going to listen to God either. Well, this is the nation in which we have. Those 50-year-old seeds have now came to harvest. The chickens have came home to roost. Of this humanistic, experimental thing in which we have done to society. But I got good news for you. God is on his way. God is on his way. Give me just a few more minutes, if you will. Verse 14. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows right well. See, I know the Lord. I know him personally. Why? Because he lives in me. How could you not have somebody who lives in your own house and not know them? That would be virtually impossible. You've got to know them. They live in your house. So if God lives in my house, I know the man. And the man knows me better than I know him. But he constantly reveals himself to me every day of my life. That's why I thank him. I thank him every day for the blessings. Wake up in the morning. Church, don't get out of bed going, Oh, God, here we go. It's Monday. Get me to the coffee pot and I'm going to be okay. <laughs> No, 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 no. Look, and I understand. I, look, look, some of, of y'all got a few years on me. When I'm getting ready to turn 65, I don't jump out of bed. I roll out of bed. <laughs> but I do it with a grateful heart that I can get my bowed legs down on that floor and stroll myself to the coffee pot. Hallelujah. <laughs> and thank God for the coffee. Thank you, Jesus. See, it's all in the way that you view things that makes your day different than anybody else's. You know, uh, sometimes I get an opportunity to work a little bit outside, and it helps in this $5 gallon gas. Any money is good money. And uh, once in a while, I get called. Uh, well, I, 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 got, I got a call the other day uh, for somebody needing my help on a job, and it was 1030 in the morning, and I had to go get a truck, and I had to go to Middletown, Delaware, pick up a piece of equipment, and then I had to go to Baltimore and pick up another piece of equipment and then bring it back to Delmar. And I said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There's several hours in between the time I got started and the time I came back. Made me some money. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. 
Give him his part. I took mine. Glory be to God. Other people would have said, man, 10 o'clock in the morning, I don't go to work no 10 o'clock. I go to work anytime. I'm used to it. I'm on call 24-7, church. Pastoring ain't no 9-to-5 ain't no job. Boy, it will, I tell you what. If it was a 9-to-5 job, and the only thing I had to do was preach on Sunday, whew, boy, this would be the job. And I wish that was, no, I don't. You know why? Because I love you all. I can't be everything to you, and I try, but I do love you all. And you are the best church that a pastor could possibly ever get an opportunity to pastor. You are. I'm telling you, I brag about you all the time. Last Sunday night, I met with a man. I'm getting ready to close here. Ben, you can come on back. Last Sunday night, I met with a man uh, who I haven't seen in many years. And he's trying to help out in a situation of a church that's really uh, disintegrating. And one of the things that I told him was this. I said, sir, I can't comprehend the problems in which you're dealing with because I don't have them. He goes, really? I go, no, I don't have them. Why? Because I do things by the word of God and there's no argument to it. You can't argue with that. And I'm consistent in the Word of God on everything across the board, no matter who you are. The Word of God is the Word of God. Friends are friends. I love friends. And, you know, I got good friends. I got close friends. But the Word of God is the Word of God. And that doesn't change. And I don't put up with nonsense. If you think for one minute you're going to have nonsense in here, not long. You either repent from it or you're not going to be comfortable. Hallelujah. Why? Because this is the house of God. I've had bar rooms. I don't need them no more. I want the stability of a people who want to come in and do one thing. Praise and worship the Almighty God. Hallelujah. And learn something from His Word. Quickly. I've got a few minutes. Psalms 135, if you will. I'll go through it very quickly. Only six verses. Praise you, the Lord. Praise you, the name of the Lord. Praise Him, O heavens, servants of the Lord. One, two, three, four, five, I believe. Five times in a short sentence. There you go. One, two, three. One, two, three, three. Whatever. It was all about what? Praising. David. This is a psalm of David. Listen to this. Verse 2, you who stand in the house of the Lord and in the courts of the house of, of our God. Verse 3, praise the Lord, for he is good. Sing praises to his name, for he is pleasant. Verse 4, for the Lord has chosen Jacob and to himself and, and Israel for his particular treasure. They were chosen people, chosen to do what? Do what I'm doing, praising you and, 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 and promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ. They chose not to. God gave the Gentiles their job, you and I. Verse 5, for I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Little g, little g, because why? Why is he above all gods? Because they don't exist. Verse 6, whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven, and the earth and the seas are all the deep places. God's got it. Listen to this, listen to this. i got five minutes, hang on. Luke 22. I gotta give you I gotta give you all of it. Luke 22. Luke 22. Verse 22. Hold on. I'm in the wrong place. I was talking when I put this together. This is Earl's fault. Earl knows what I'm talking about. I'm just kidding with you, Earl. <laughs> verse 22. Here we go. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought of your life, which you shall eat neither for the body than what you shall put on. Next verse. Life is more than meat and the body and is more than raiment. I'll sum it up this way. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse 7. Last verse I want to give you. And the best one I can, I can sum it up with. So Peter says, through the prompting of the Holy Spirit, in verse 7, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares of you. 
So why am I going to think about what I'm going to eat? I mean, we do. We think about dinner. I'm not talking about like that. What I'm, thinking, what I'm talking about, is it going to be there? Yes. Why? Because I'm a child of God. Not because I'm special, but because I'm saved. And because I'm saved, God put his self in obligations to me to make sure I've got the meat that I need. It may not always be the meat that I want, but praise the Lord, I got it anyway. What about raiment? It's not important that I wear, and I never would. I mean, listen. Some people go out and they buy a $5,000 Armani suit. It's the same thing. It's made out of cotton. This has got somebody else's name in it. It's not Armani by no stretch of the imagination. It's like I don't begrudge anybody of anything. You want to ride down the road in a Cadillac? Do that. But my old Pinto will take me just as far as that old Cadillac will. <laughs> For some of you who remember what a Pinto is. <laughs> Vegas, Chevrolet Vegas, Ford Mavericks. Cast all, cast all, cast all your cares upon him. Listen to the, to the, to the reference. Refers to a direct and once for all committed to God, to all that would give us concern. We all have concern, but you can't let it get you to a place of misery. Of ringing your head, whoa, what am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to praise the Lord. What did Joshua say? Joshua said, choose this day whom you shall serve. Be in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Because my God's bigger. My God's bigger than what the world is going through right now. My God is bigger than Washington, D.C. My God is bigger than Dover, Delaware. My God is bigger than the devil. Hallelujah. My God is bigger. He's a big God. Pray for big things. Hallelujah. So whatever your situation is this morning, this altar is the place for you to be. It is. This is not made for sinners, all, all, all just for sinners. Yeah, it's made for sinners, but it's made for righteous. To come and step out your boat, Peter. Reach down, get your big old hand full of faith. Instead of fear. Oh, if I come to the altar, people are going to be saying that I did something wrong. They're saying that anyway. <laughs> Mom will come get it under the blood. I ain't about doing anything wrong. The altar is a great place to just come praise God. Just come kneel before Him and praise God. Amen. I don't call an altar call for my ego. I call an altar call for you. For you to come solidify that in what you know that God wants you to have. And He wants you to have it, church. He wants you to have peace and serenity and happiness. And if you go out of here any other way this morning than that, then it's your own fault. Don't blame God. Because He's here today. His Spirit has been here since I walked in the building. Hallelujah. He's just waiting on us. Let's stand as we get ready to go to God in prayer. <laughs> Please come take a moment. Whatever your concern is, whatever you're dealing with, come today. <laughs>